right, so ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get underway here. I'm going to briefly introduce where you are for those of you who are here for the first time, as well as the topic of today's lecture and a little bit of background about the speaker herself. This is the Institute of World Politics. Uh, I am the operations manager here. If you have any questions about our school, graduate school, feel free to come up and ask any one of us who work here. We uh, teach the full spectrum of statecraft and national security affairs and the application of statecraft uh, within the prism of the Western moral tradition uh, as our curriculum here. Uh, Patricia is actually a graduate of the Institute of World Politics. Today's event, uh, unless I'm mistaken, given the cameras here, is going to be on the record. That means that you may take pictures. Uh, we just ask in the interest of collegiality that when and if you ask questions, you please state your name and your affiliation. So, Patricia, thank you for coming by here yet again. It's a pleasure to do this, just like old times. So today's lecture is going to be entitled The North Korean Energy Picture, Potential and Reality. A little bit of background about Patricia. So she is an energy analyst based in D.C. and an associate member of the New College at Oxford University with extensive experience in global energy market studies and political risk analysis with a focus mostly on Europe, the United States, and Russia. Patricia is, uh, was recently selected as one of the top 40 most influential energy, uh, individuals in the energy sector by Right Relevance Incorporated in San Francisco, California. And she has previously worked at uh, Le Figaro newspaper in Paris and was a parliamentary assistant and attaché at the French National Assembly. Uh, while working for a petrochemical company, she wrote her thesis on the U.S. foreign, pol on US foreign policy towards terrorism after 9-11 uh, with a focus on the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and before that, too, she uh, was a member of Chatham House, um, leading several research projects in the areas of energy security and emerging threats and critical energy infrastructure, as well as policy and risk assessment of European and Russian oil and gas systems. So no doubt she has a wealth of background and knowledge to bring today's to today's conversation. I want to thank you so much again for coming up. And uh, without further ado, let us see the floor to you, and let's give her a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, it's a good crowd. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here with you today to talk about that uh, interesting issue of North Korea. And so, uh, when it comes to uh, North Korea, appearance can be misleading. And it's a good way to start with an anecdote or a legend, because uh, according to the legend, uh, during the Cold War, Soviet Union spy satellites were fixed on the Washington DC area, including the Pentagon. And the Russian military analyst spent days in, days out, watching the footage. And one day, some of the Russian analysts noticed an intriguing trend while filming from above the Pentagon operations. In the middle of the Pentagon, there was a courtyard. And in that courtyard was a building that seemed of high interest. All day long, from early morning until late in the evening, military officers from all the services, from all ranks and specialties, would exit the Pentagon and cross the courtyard, walking straight to the building at the center of the courtyard. And the officers will approach the buildings and leave and carrying some sort of small items in their hands. So intelligence analysts examined the photos closely. What sort of highly valuable information was being exchanged in this top secret nerve center at the very center of the Pentagon? So important that service members of every rank flocked to it day after day. Believing it was a target of at most importance, the Soviet Union counted it as a top target in, in, in case of strike. But today we can reveal what the actual purpose was of this important Pentagon facilities. It was a hot dog stand. <laughs> so that's to tell you that lately, why I'm coming up with that issue of North Korea is there was too much focus on nuclear proliferation, and there's more to that. And so this is where I will come to it with that presentation. So immediately frustrating to anyone studying the North Korean economy is the near total absence of formal data. 
um, this is this, this lack of information discourages most economists from studying the economic dilemmas that this government finds itself in and makes investment either by North Koreans or foreigners a highly speculative activity. One underlying aspect of the DPRK international situation, its energy insecurity or lack of reliable supplies of fuels to maintain and build its economy has changed little over the past few years and remains both an underlying driver of the DPRK's behaviors in discussions with other nations on energy and a possible lever for other nations to use to begin and sustain the process of engagement with the DPRK. And as we know, the traditional definition of energy security by the IEA is as the uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. But North, North Korea's definition of energy security goes beyond the traditional, as we know, fuel supply, fuel co uh, cost focus to include elements of energy supply, economics and economic impacts, environmental impact and environmental security, technological security, social and political security, and military security. In the case of the DPRK, uh, the last two decades have seen a profound erosion of energy security in both the narrow and the broad sense, with significant impact on the DPRK's economy, its society, and its environment. The relationship between energy supply and the industrial sector in the DPRK is complicated uh, because when the Soviet Union was dissolved in the early 90s, the DPRK lost not only its major supply of crude oil and parts of it, uh, in many cases Soviet-built, uh, power plants and factories, uh, but also markets for the bulk of the goods uh, that its factories were designated to produce. So it's difficult to understand what fraction of the decline of the DPRK industrial sector uh, is due to lack of energy and which part is due to lack of market, presumably with sufficient energy supply coupled with funds for um, investment in new capital equipment, um, likely the access to international market. So North Korean factories will be able to retool to provide goods needed at home and with markets abroad. So North Korea's um, energy circumstances are in many respects an extreme version of those that South Korea confront. Um, you have some coal and hydroelectric power, but no onshore oil reserve and no natural gas. The most attractive potential source of the hydrocarbons for North Korea, as for South Korea, lies in the Middle East. So that's more than 6,000 miles away. For both the North and the South, nuclear power has a certain logic in energy terms. Uh, political military issues aside, uh, in that case. So does natural gas, uh, with Korea's huge Russian neighbors holding nearly one-third of global proven reserves. The energy circumstances of North Korea's are different from its southern twin in one massive way. The North isolation uh, from the international system as a result, of course, of the eccentric foreign policy as we've seen, its belligerent uh, military posturing and its persistent development of nuclear weapons and other instruments of mass destruction. But since the collapse of the Soviet Union, it lasts consistent ally. Uh, at the end of 1991, um, its energy infrastructure, like its national economy more generally, has uh, decayed sharply. Uh, no foreign energy assistance other than heavy oil supply um, under the uh, agreed framework between 95 and, and 2002 has come to the country's aid. So North Korea, like South Korea, historically has had a high uh, energy use economy. Uh, in the North case, this was caused by a, a very important industrial portfolio, which was focused on heavy and chemical industries such as metals, machinery, chemicals, mining. This heavy industrial bias uh, with its high energy use orientation was then perpetuated and even intensified during the, the first two decades after the Korean War, as the DPRK's economy moved to an increasingly militarized footing. Primary commercial energy use in the DPRK per unit of output was approximately three times the level of China in 1990 and about half the level of Japan which had a GDP per capita 20 times as high as North Korea at the time. Inefficient use of fuels, uh, owning to obsolete equipment as far as a lack of market prices and reliance on relatively less efficient fuels, such as coal, has intensified the high energy bias originally created by the industrial 
uh, structure. The high energy orientation of the North Sea economy, together with poor underlying energy resource endowments and the importance of energy to North Korea's military, make energy a priority concern for the DPRK's political military leadership. And Kim, Kim Il-sung noted in the 80s that, as an, and I quote, without electricity, we cannot produce anything, either in peacetime or wartime. So Kim's statement is proving to be even more true now, a generation later. Uh, North Korea's leadership appears concerned on, not only with the quantity of energy inputs for the DPRK's economy, but increasingly with their quality as well. Power outages and the current volatility, uh, the electrical grid, among other problems, uh, have become increasingly uh, pronounced over the past decade, as the equipment, which dates back to 1958, uh, becomes increasingly antiquated. So as the information revolution proceeds worldwide in both its civilian and military dimension, and as state-of-the-art industrial facilities become more and more technology intensive, the quality of electric power becomes more important to the DPRK in all aspects of economic and military life. So a highly computerized industrial complex, North Korea is beginning to discover that they cannot run on the erratic power supply with which Pyongyang, not to mention provincial, provincial time, uh, towns is presently afflicted. So I'll go through the um, deeper case energy resource. So those are, you know, we have the first slide, introductory slide, showed, was the satellite pictures of North Korea uh, taken at night, uh, and it showed the severity of North Korea's energy shortage, with the only dot of light in the entire country emanating from uh, Pyongyang. Even the capital city has frequent blackouts. Uh, foreigners uh, visiting Pyongyang, and if some, some of you may have visited, have uh, spoken of sections of the grid being turned on as they arrive and turned off again as they leave, in the poor effort to create the illusion of widespread availability of electricity. It is well known that only the elite of the North Korean society uh, living in Pyongyang, uh, so the majority uh, of this, have these limited resources are diverted there, leaving the rest of the country with very little. Uh, and according to the World Bank, only 26% of North Korea, which is 24 million people, have access to electricity. Uh, and even those 26% only get it uh, sporadically. So North Korea's energy output comes mostly from coal-fired thermal plants and from hydroelectric dams, 20% uh, and 70% respectively. The primary energy resource currently used in the DPRK are coal, um, almost all of which is domestically produced. Uh, DPRK coal reserves are estimated up to 15 billion tons, according to South Korean Central Bank, which corresponds to 100 years of supply at recent and current production level. Um, so recent years have seen a considerable increase in DPRK coal exports to China, with other 12 million tons of coal shipped in 2012. Petroleum is also um, included imported crude oil, um, of course, uh, from China, and a somewhat smaller amount of imported refined petroleum products sourced from several nations, uh, but primarily China and Russia. I didn't include it in the, in the slides here, but wood and biomass as well. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at North Korea for Google Map, uh, which is supposed to be Greenland, but they're burning a lot of wood uh, as they harvest. It's quite expensive. It's quite extensive. Um, so they use a crop residue as biomass. So its annual har harvest of wood uh, is about 10 million ton tons, which is represent about 40 percent more than the es es estimated sustainable uh, wood yields. Uh, crop, crop waste add another 45 million tons uh, per year of biomass resource. Uh, hydroelectric power as well, and I'll go more extensively on each of, the, of, each of them in the next slides. Um, from a number of hydroelectric plants situated along the major and smaller rivers of the DPRK, a number of sources suggest that DPRK hydro, hydraulic uh, resource is sufficient to provide about 10 gigawatts of electric power of hydroelectric generation. So North Korea's uh, domestic energy situation uh, needs to be considered in terms of four, um, four basic aspects. Uh, supply of basic energy 
electric power generation, which is hydroelectric power, thermal plant, electric power transmission, their grid management, and energy alternative, which is nuclear, natural gas, and so on. So electric power is, um, is the North pet peeve. It's not easy for them, uh, where its energy problems come together, and the factor that most directly affect the functioning of the North overall economy. The DPRK's circumstances are dire, uh, along all those four aspects. Uh, and the energy problem that the North confronts in all these areas are interrelated and continue to deteriorate. But the nature of the difficulties involved is somewhat different in, in different areas. Um, so in short, nuclear power in North Korea is, is the ultimate route to both energy independence and political autonomy, which I will come up uh, later on. So in 2000, uh, just to put it in context, uh, the, the North use of coal and production of electricity had, fall, had fallen to almost a quarter of its 1990 level. And overall energy end use had dropped to less than 40% of what it had been a decade before. Since 2000, the energy sector has been sustained primarily by an annual half million tons of crude oil from China, modest imports of refined oil products, uh, and Korean tenacity and ingenuity helps to keep those aging power and coal production infrastructure going, and the substitution of wood and other biomass for subsistence energy use. Much of the DPRK's uh, energy and industrial infrastructure date back decades ago, with some dating to the 1920s uh, Japanese occupation era. And since 2000, there have been modest improvements in the energy se sector, uh, in large part by Chinese investment. So in the recent years, the, the North has seen, has announced the construction of new hydroelectric power plants, uh, presumably using domestically built turbine and generators. Uh, some of these are rel relatively large, but I will show you later in, in, in those in pictures, but insufficient in output to make much of a dent in the unmet demand. Uh, so the plants probably will mostly serve the area, areas in which it's located. So if you see, um, in, like in the in the in the um, top right, it's a region where they have hydroelectric that will just cover that local region. It will not cover a broader beyond that. Another key change has been significant export of coal from the deeper RK to China in quantities ranging from 2.8 to 3.8 million tons per year uh, from 2005 to 2009. Chinese firm have invested in infrastructure to extract and export coal and other minerals, uh, but the impact of this investment on energy sufficiency in the DPRK is too small. So still the shortages of power and coal persist, uh, with blackouts even in Pyongyang and much more tenuous power supplies in other areas. Many rural areas, for example, receive power only during key agricultural seasons and, and must make do during the rest of the year with alternative fuel. So in effect, the North Korean electricity system, nominally a na nationwide transmission and distribution grid, is a patchwork of regional and local grids uh, centered around major and smaller power plants. So this means that even if large amounts of fuel or electricity were suddenly available to the North, distribution of, of that energy will be problematic. Um, help has been required uh, from other countries for the DPRK's uh, economy to remain even at its current subsistence level, but it's still hard for them to maintain what they need. So the North, the North receives sufficient crude oil from China to keep one of its two oil refineries running, but well below the full capacity. So the oil is paid for at market prices, uh, but the North runs on an annual trade deficit with China. So Chinese export can and do vary by month, sometimes substantially, possibly because of political motivation as well, but also due to factors such as refineries uh, needing some uh, maintenance as well. But Chinese export of petroleum products to the DPRK have been similarly stable, uh, averaging about 130,000 tons per year since 2003, and varying by a maximum of just over 10% on an annual basis during that period. So that suggests to us that although China is willing to provide fuel to keep the DPRK's economy from failing, it is unwilling to provide sufficient assistance to actually redevelop the North Korean the North economy until Pyongyang can afford the, the uh, additional imports on its own. 
So the combination of erosion in its energy system and in its industrial and, and transportation infrastructure as well, as the lack of investment capital means that the North will not be able to redevelop its energy system without outside help. So decades of relative isolation clearly have left Pyongyang largely without capabilities um, in metallurgy, electronics, other fields uh, that will allow it to develop this industry without outside assistance. So now we'll touch on um, the crude oil aspect. It's a little bit dry because I wanted to get the context of uh, all these materials, but then you'll, it, it, will, it will make more sense as we go through. Um, the DPRK does appear to have potentially major offshore uh, oil deposit located on the seabed west of Anjou uh, in the Yellow Sea with potential reserve as much as 12 billion barrels of oil. North Korea has tried to develop this offshore reserve in cooperation with a wide range of foreign parties, uh, including China, Russia, Australia, Sweden, and it goes all the way to the latest being the United Kingdom in 2004. Um, but on each occasion, either it didn't go through because of territorial issues between the DPRK and, and nearby China, or a financial and legal question which prevent those ventures to happen and to achieve its meaningful results. So serious expo exploration of these uh, promising offshore oil reserves will need to await a resolution of the Korean nuclear crisis, which is to be seen. But the prospect of such exploration could be a meaning meaningful incentive uh, for the DPRK to accede to and actually observe an agreement acceptable to the other five parties to the nuclear talks. So proximity and territorial issues vis-a-vis -vis China makes it clear that actual expo exploration uh, would also require the consent of China, uh, which would retain leverage in the actual development process because they will provide the technology, the investment, and, and so on. So after doing uh, quite some research and, and you know, traveling through Google Maps, not traveling in North Korea, um, this is a picture of the um, expansion of the old terminal uh, of Nampo, which is midway along North Korea's west coast. Uh, and that has been underway since October 2015. What I, wanted to show, what I want to show you here is the fact that they've been expanding their um, oil reserves. Um, so as you see on the 2015 picture, you didn't have those two other um, um, uh, reserves um, yeah, over there. So you, it's a message that tells you that they're actually keeping some, some oil um, in, in case something happened. The other question is, um, does cutting off North Korea's oil supply, is it actually devastating for them? Um, so as of today, Washington wants to restrain the regime in Pyongyang and eventually denuclearize de 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 the peninsula. But the United States uh, possesses few levers uh, it can employ to shift North Korean policy. So for quite some time now, uh, a prominent strand of the conventional, conventional wisdom endorsed the idea that the U.S. should pressure China to shut off oil export to the government of Kim Jong-un. But Chinese oil cutoff would lead to the collapse of the North Korean regime. This is the, the, the logic. Uh, and it seems convincing, uh, and it may even guide upcoming actions sponsored by the, U the United States or the, or the UN Security Council. But oil plays an essential role in many industrial and uh, military processes. And North Korea has virtually no domestic oil production and has long been relying on external sponsors, as I've explained before, which once was the Soviet Union and today is China for imports. So the assumption is, take away the oil and the North Korean economy will spur to a halt and possibly lead to region collapse. Well, that's not going to happen. Because threats to North Korea's oil supply are unlikely to resolve uh, the stalemate as quickly and easily as the scenario envisions. So despite the oil talismanic status and real economic importance, threats to cut states off from petroleum supplies are more complicated than the light switch model implies. In particular, North Korea's decades of economic isolation and the Kim regime, intense desire to survive, actually render it less vulnerable to pressure from an embargo. Uh, 
mirror it, some you get some analysis uh, about oh well that that mirrors the 1973 1974 oil crisis after the Arab um, oil producers raised the price of oil to then the uh, unprecedented unprecedented uh, high. Planners and politici politicians fear that OPEC oil cartel would put oil-consuming countries in a position of unprecedented strategic vulnerability. And we've heard it from the realist theorists like uh, Hans Morgenthau that said, oh, well, uh, oil-producing countries could destroy the political, economic, and social fabric of a country totally dependent on oil imports such as Japan by imposing an embargo. But rather like nuclear deterrence and compliance, the significance of this threat will not be in, uh, in exercising it, but in the way a government could explore its, its leverage over an all important importing state to pursue policy changes in the targeted area and regime. Yet the record of relations between oil producing and oil consuming countries since the 1970s has fallen far from short of the dire prediction. So major oil importers have become less vulnerable to supply shock than they were in 73. Uh, through the creation of strategic reserve and investment in energy efficiency. But the difference between North Korea and the developed world point to the conclusion that Pyongyang is even less vulnerable to energy interruption than developed economies. Uh, on a superficial level, North Korea appears ex extraordinarily, extraordinarily vulnerable to energy shutoffs. Uh, the regime has long faced energy security problems despite its vast reserves of coal and hydropower potential. Such dependency has yet to result in the sort of political vulnerability that embargo advocates claim already exists. But as the US uh, um, Energy Information Administration notes, uh, the EIA, the end of the Cold War led to the end of Soviet subsidized oil imports. And North Korean oil consumption has, has dropped from 76,000 barrels per day in 1991 to 15,000 barrels per day in 2016. So over the same period, the country's population has uh, risen, but an estimated 5 million people. So even accounting for the possibility of, of smuggling and of the book trade, it's likely that the DPRK has long since adjusted uh, to losing well over three quarters of its per capita daily consumption of all relative to the Cold War period. So it's true that the uh, North Korean economy has fallen, but it's also true that the acute economic pain of the 90s and 2000 has not led to regime ch change or collapse. Uh, the North Korean state has adapted three strategies, uh, increased reliance on hydropower, greater exploitation of its coal reserves, and simply doing without. Um, so the EIA estimate that North Korea's electricity consumption remains at about half its 1990 levels. So in the transportation sector, mechanics have adapted previously petrol-reliant trucks to burn wood, which is something you don't see anymore. Um, so however, the, the fact that the North relies on Chinese import does not at all imply that such imports are the regime's lifeline. Uh, it might only mean that the regime is making a calculated decision about where to allocate those resources. So the fact that North Korea imports oil rather than turning to autarky reflects a straightforward economic logic. Uh, cost matters, uh, even for the uh, Juche philosophy of self-reliance, and turning Korean coal to oil is more expensive than trading Korean coal for Chinese oil, uh, which is the conversion from coal to oil just to chemical uh, reaction of steam and oxygen, but it's, it's what they do. So in, the, in terms of uh, hydropower, um, North Korea, to be sure, they do have substantial hydroelectric power capacity. In fact, the North capacity is well over double uh, the South, despite the huge converse gap between the capacities of the Koreas in other aspects of energy. Uh, its mountainous terrain and relative plentiful rainfall uh, provide the DPOK with unusual hydroelectric potential from a global comparative standpoint. Its rate of develop, developable, developable hydroelectric power per square kilometer is 77.4 uh, kilowatt compared with the global average of 50 kilowatts. So it's way above the, the average. 
Um, hydro provides well over half of today's electric power supply in the DPOK, and production could clearly go higher with additional capital investment and application of more sophisticated technology. But yet, during the Korean dry season, uh, because the, the operating capacity of the hydroelectric power plants dropped sharply, um, severely decreasing the amount of power generated and giving a distinct, distinctly cyclical character of North Korea's secondary energy supply. So it's especially inconvenient and frustrating to the North Korean economic planners because 85% of the DPRK's hydropower is harnessed for industrial use. And then what we may ask is, so what does North Korea export? Uh, and there's a, many more uh, on this graph, uh, but the main focus is, uh, for, for now, is, the coal, is coal. Um, they have significant coal resource, mostly produced from underground mines. This domestic coal is very low in quality uh, and is nevertheless North Korea main fuel for electricity generation. Coal mining usually requires electricity for lightning, uh, jackhammers, moving coal out of the mines, and this is not what they have. So in addition, uh, imported coal seems uh, are actually beneath the seabed, especially up the western corner of Anju, which requires seawater to be continuously pumped out, pumped out for the mine to, be, to operate. So several of these mines were flooded in the mid-1990s, so the coal that can be produced in North Korea is an even in quality. They never know what they're going to get which creates significant operational problems, especially for new coal fire plants. So in 2001, coal provided 86% of North Korea's primary energy consumption, uh, a share that rose sharply during the 90s as the DPRK isolation from the world of world uh, intensified. So since 2002, North Korea turned even more intensive, intensively to coal uh, as the only fuel it could uh, increase through its own effort. So in 2003, uh, for example, the North increased budget allocations to coal production uh, by more than 30%, uh, by far the largest increase in the country's non-military budget. So the DPRK is attempting to increase coal production by both improving its technology, modernizing existing uh, large-scale mines, as it also develops smaller mines as well. Electric power transmission um, is the third major difficulty that North Korea has with supply of domestic energy. Uh, it's re relatively closely to problems of generation. Uh, its original power grid was created in Japanese colonial days, which is 60 years ago, more than that, and uh, was decimated during the Korean War. So voltage and frequency fluctuation uh, are orders of magnitude greater than the international standards. So North Korea has taken recent steps to address one of its serious electric power grid problems. So in, in mid-2005, they announced a new computerized grid management system, um, this card that you see, that will allow the DPRK electric power providers to know exactly how much power was being consumed by a given consumer in any, any region. So this new system also is a double advocate because it allowed the DPRK electricity providers to cut off will limit the amount of power consumed by any given consumer. So it remains unclear how effective the proposed system is and how much it, it will actually enhance much needed energy efficiency. But this is what you have when you go to North Korea to get that card to allow you to get electricity. I will not get into the military nuclear power, but I'll get into the civilian one, uh, because that started uh, before in the 1980s. Um, the DPRK domestic nuclear power program had the stated goal of using the DPR DPRK uranium resource as a, source, as a source of energy to augment its existing, mostly coal, and hydroelectric power plant fleet. The, so the, the North Korea contracted with the former Soviet Union in 1985 to build two reactors at what later became the Simpo site, the Chimpo site, on the DPRK eastern co co coast. Uh, this deal stalled of a payment for the reactors and was never completed, uh, but the DPRK clearly linked its joining of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty with gaining nuclear power plants. So the Soviet reactors became moot when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, and a new discussion 
in, uh, started in 1991 of light water reactors in the DPRK. First in the joint um, South Korea, North Korea nuclear talks in 92, uh, and then as part of the US DPRK talks over the discrepancies in, in its declaration of nuclear facility to the IEA as to how much plutonium it produced and separated. When, as a part of the US DPOK uh, 1994 agreed framework, the DPOK agreed to give up its plans for a domestically built graphite moderate, moderated reactor uh, that will produce more plutonium. It, it was the understanding that North Korea will receive two modern large uh, LWR units to be built in Shimpo in the DPOK under the auspices of the multinational Korean Peninsula Energy Development Organization, uh, KEDO, KEDO. So at that point, the KEDO reactors uh, became the benchmark for cooperation options in the energy sector with the DPRK. So the KEDO DPOK plan for two or even one uh, thousand megawatt unit ignored one very big problem, is that these LWR couldn't be used on the existed existing DPOK electricity grid. Uh, operating a 1,000 megawatt LWR on the grid will have been impossible uh, because the grid is sufficiently unstable that the LWR will be shutting down regularly. So it will require lengthy restarts, risking damage of the plants, but also because their power system uh, is not functioning perfectly and is too small as well. So in terms of generating capacity, it, it, it won't be safe to op operationalize those nuclear plants as large as a thousand uh, megawatt. But then they also have a different source of, er of energy, which uh, we might not think of, but they do have solar energy. Um, so if you, you can buy uh, solar panels in North Korea, um, think of it as the North Korean Best Buy, uh, a shop stuffed with refrigerators, karaoke machines, laptop computers, flat screen TV, and solar panels, but with a square footage closer to a typical American 7-Eleven um, than a big box store. Um, so it has, it has been, it, this is how, how, how you can buy those. So the cheapest panel um, is a 50 watt Chinese import. Um, they sell it for $35 at the official exchange rate, which is about a typical month wage for a factory worker. While a 200 watt, 24 volt version uh, was going for about $160. So North Korea are turning to solar power in a major way, uh, with cheap panels readily available in neighboring China. It's a gray market that is expanding uh, and a green energy drive that is endorsed by Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un. And this being a, a remarkable flowering of photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic panels across the, uh, across the country. And I can show you some more pictures. Um, but they have not published how, how, any figures on how much it generates, so how much it generates. But you can see more solar panels on balconies, apartment buildings, street lights. Um, so estimated, it's estimated that solar account for just 0.1% of all electricity generated, and that was 2015. But it's increasing. The, uh, I, I don't know how much it will be in the future, but it's getting there. So 100,000 or more North Korean households uh, in the country of 24 million had acquired solar panels through the end of 2014. So it's pretty uh, important for a start. So the, the vast majority of the solar equipment being used in North Korea is Chinese made, uh, but the country claimed to have several um, capacities that they're building new, new ones uh, in North Korea. But they're also using renewable energy source for their air base, the military. Uh, and they're likely to do so in the future. Uh, the power plant is a major source of electricity in this unit 1016. Uh, the unit can freely use enough electricity for combat preparation while cooking and heating with it. Uh, the plant freed the unit from the shortage of electricity and some of the excessive power uh, is supplied even to a batting resort in the unit stationary area. <coughs> 
North Korea may be using this unit as a test site uh, for renewable energy source that could potentially alleviate energy shortage uh, throughout the country. So they're they're considering it as a long term um, as a long term use. Uh, and as Kim Jong Un said, I quote: "It is important to conduct a dynamic drive to widely used natural energy, including wind, solar array, and geothermal, in order to solve the electricity problem of the country." But to, to summarize a bit um, all the different uh, source of energy they have, uh, they also have issues and problems to develop it. So the first one is inefficient and or decaying infrastructure, because as we saw, much of the energy using infrastructure in the DPRK is reportedly and visibly, uh, if you visit, is antiquated and poorly maintained. Um, suppress the map and demand for energy services, lack of fuel in many sectors of the North Korean economy has apparently caused demand for energy services to go unmet. Uh, significant issue with suppressed and latent demand for energy service uh, is that when supply constraints are removed, there is likely to be a surge in energy use as consumers increase the use of energy services uh, towards their needs. And lack of energy product markets. Uh, compounding the risk of a surge in the use of energy service is the virtual lack of energy product markets in the DPRK. And another aspect I was looking at, so I, I wanted to map out beyond the belief of, you know, besides nuclear proliferation, uh, I want to look at the strategic level because there's not much we can, there's not much data available on that. But there's one focus I've been looking at lately, among other projects, is the friendship pipeline, uh, which nobody is not well known, um, which is the, the main la mainland crossing between China and North Korea, um, which is now looking pretty much like Checkpoint Charlie uh, between East and West Germany in the Cold War. Um, the friendship bridge uh, with single, rail, single road and rail lines uh, was only a few months ago bustling 24-7 trucks queuing to cross, but today it is a, a pretty tense border. Pumping station on the banks of the Yalu uh, that sends almost the entire crude oil supply sustaining North Korea, especially its military, uh, because they have a buried pipeline under that bridge, uh, has become the single most important and most closely watched uh, and secured pipeline. There's been some... Uh, Feedbacks, uh, especially from the, the Chinese embassy, for instance, about vehicles queuing for oil uh, and about to return of petrol rationing, uh, which indirect clearly that China is starting to constrict its supply. So this may prove the key to bringing Pyongyang back into negotiation that this time hold the prospect of a nuclear halt and even better retreat. So the, what we can ask is how much could China sends uh, through the friendship pipeline, uh, which starts in Dandong, a trading hub in northeast China, and travels under the Yalu River to North Korea. It's not it's not precisely known because China stopped reporting those figures uh, several years ago. Uh, but given its economic growth, North Korea will be expected to import about 850,000 tons of crude oil this year. Uh, almost entirely from China, despite the sanction. Uh, but we've seen lately, and, and this week also, last week, um, the CNPC, China National uh, Petroleum Corporation, suspended sales of diesel and gasoline. So sanctions are working, but not entirely. Uh, even if China did cut off uh, crude oil supply, North Korea, particularly its military, would be able to operate for a while. And uh, there were, CNPC was asked to shut down this pipeline and to comply with the sanction, but they said we cannot do it because stopping the flow of, of this uh, pipeline will uh, damage the pipeline, uh, which is absolutely not true. Um, they pretend that as you stop the pipeline, it can clog out. Um, engineers from the company wrote uh, back to the NSC saying that uh, it will build up and block the pipe if the flow stops. So they can stop it. For the, they can stop the floor for eight hours at most during summer times, and for no more than two hours during winter times. But that tells you that the sanctions are working, but they're not telling you what obviously uh, what they're actually doing, which is keep the flow going. 
And the last question is, I want to I want to touch on briefly is is North Korea really short of energy then? Uh, and asking this question is really much like asking if the United States short of gasoline. Um, everyone claims that higher uh, gasoline prices suggest a shortage, but we still see giant SUVs dominate the highways. So we take for granted North Korea's assertion that it lacks energy, and indeed it is obvious uh, to visitors that lights and elevators don't work, and that electric trains shut down in the middle of the countryside. But if energy is so short in supply, we should ask our North Korean interlocut interlocutors why then is it so cheap? Uh, if they respond, it is the plant system uh, that allocates our energy and our prices, then if you can, ask for the data and the plant itself. Um, I will leave it there and uh, open to questions. Thank you.